We have started to record the most recent session of SPCH 1113, Introduction to Public Speaking for the first summer session. It is Thursday, June 22nd, 2023. The end is in sight. Today is class session 15 of 19 scheduled. Monday through Thursday of next week is wildcard week with research and topic selection Monday and Tuesday, day one and day two, the final two days of the term on Wednesday and Thursday. Keep in mind that we've also this week discussed the self-evaluation speech critique, which is why it is so important that you watch every last minute of every last video because I try to be as specific as possible throughout all of our videos with extensive evaluations in a positive way of how all of you have improved. And that continues. We got off to a very positive start with day one of persuasive speeches yesterday. Is everything going to be perfect? No, but keep in mind, as I've always indicated, the positive constructive criticism I give you is designed to help you improve from one week to the next because ideally, in that case, the grades will take care of themselves. With that in mind, Let's return to yesterday's class session on Class Collaborate Ultra and take a look at what some of your classmates were involved with. We've got it queued to the first few minutes of our class session, and let's pick it up from here. So here we go. Hi, I'm Aubriana, and I will be doing my presentation on why we need to get rid of side note letters. Now, before I can convince you to get rid of them, I need to explain to you what they are. Now, auxiliary silent letters mostly deal with letter pairings, like so extracentric letter, letter pairings. They don't sound like either one of the letters that are combined, like the NG in King. Or endo, endocentric letter pairings, like the double T in letter, sound like the T. Now, dummy letters most, mostly deal with individual letters. Like, like, for example, an insert letter, the G in resign, you can't hear it. But the G in resignation, you can hear that. So for that, it's a pronunciation thing. That's why it's an insert silent letter. And to the beginning of the presentation with the title of the course, that can be moved closer together, these visuals, and her webcam. There's a lot of good things that she does here. Now, one more time, let's just mute the audio, go to any point in the speech, and we've talked about this as well. Pay attention to her eye contact. She's not reading. She's being expressive like many of us. The webcam is out far enough with that wide shot. She is being naturally expressive with her hands. Thank you. This is the end of my speech. I just want to say that I personally feel like dress codes should not be such a heavily enforced thing. I feel like dress codes are unfair to a lot of people. It's unfair to certain body types. It's unfair to females, more importantly. And I just feel like dress codes really aren't as strict, really shouldn't have to be as strict as they are because no one's ever paying attention as much as you think you are. And when you don't focus on a small thing such as a dress code, you can focus on major things for a school that you can be working on. So I hope that my speech has given you a reason to look at having dress codes for schools a different way. Thank you. Those of you who are with me live saw me with my headphones right up to my ear because her audio is a little on the low side. But what I have noticed here is when we watch the recording sessions later, it automatically gets bumped up a little bit. Also, free college will increase graduation, graduation weights and financial security. The benefits of a free education. You're most likely to have a better credit in the future. Students will be able to follow their passions and abilities, and also reduces debt. No one wants to be in their 30s paying off student loans from college. 
In conclusion, thank you for watching my speech on why all education should be free. I kind of, I hope you understand. And we can see a change in the future for education. Thank you. Think about what we have seen so far. First, from Abriana. Second, from Ms. Henderson. Third, from Autumn. The improvement in their professionalism in addressing the camera, the self-confidence from all three is quite apparent. This can affect relationships, daily routines, and work and school. You, you can become nervous when trying out for a role in a play or meeting your spouse's parents for the first time, but that's not necessarily a sign of social anxiety disorder. In occurrences like that, it's very normal, especially when you're meeting someone for the first time and it's an unknown thing, it's an unknown outcoming to it, whether it's a play in a role or how the parents may react to you. That's a normal thing to feel. With social anxiety disorder, it is a social phobia. Everyday interactions cause significant anxiety, self-consciousness, and embarrassment. Social anxiety versus being shy. Being shy and having discomfort in certain situations is not exactly social anxiety disorder. It's a normal thing. Some symptoms and signs of social anxiety may include fear of situations in which you might be judged negatively, worrying about embarrassing or humiliating yourself. To the final 90 seconds, and with the closed captioning on, check out his concluding remarks, speaking in complete sentences, checking again his eye contact, his design consistency, his ability to take text and images to reinforce the concept of being aware of social anxiety. Yeah, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they will have this, this disorder when they get older. Some more biological factors include new social or work demands can cause social anxiety disorder or more anxiety. Having an experience or condition that draws attention also. Some coping tips include even though on occasion I will not start right at one o'clock because some of you will be joining us late and sometimes I go after three o'clock. We got off to a good start today with day one of persuasive speeches. Looking realistically at the improvement that you make as a speaker, that symbiotic relationship between you and the camera and how you can take your text and images and research to create a very positive and persuasive presentation. We will continue tomorrow with day two of persuasive speeches. Good luck in your respective preparation processes. As for SPCH 1113, Introduction to Public Speaking for the first summer session of 2023, that concludes the recording session for today. What you noticed with a couple of individuals, I was mentioning the audio from their webcams is a bit low. Class Collaborate Ultra and YouTube, whenever these videos are being processed, usually bumps up the sound a little bit. So if I've ever mentioned anything on course videos where I thought it would be a good idea for you to at least get a little bit closer to your webcams, that should be enough. I don't think there'll have to be any technical issues, but just double check your webcams to ensure that your audio is set as high as possible so it's easier for all of us to listen. Not necessarily making any technical adjustments to your laptop or to your desktop, but making certain that there is an honest effort to project into the camera because this is not like being in a television studio where you would have a microphone attached to your lapel or where there would be a microphone. Most people don't, for their podcasts, don't necessarily have a microphone right up against them, but it's something that is actually just built into their webcams. But that's a small thing because we're coming across quite well. Our presentations for the day are going to start with Chloe. We have a number of them, and hers is going to be placed on the screen. Some of you use Microsoft PowerPoint with video inserted. We've got some people using Loom, and this from Chloe is a slightly different application. It still works. The only downside, if there is one, 
on the bottom, I can't necessarily access any type of closed captioning, but it's a small thing. Our first persuasive speech on day two will be Chloe. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chloe Ray. I am a pre-vet major here at SAU. And for my persuasive speech today, I will be talking about why you should spay your pets. This is a very detrimental topic in the veterinary medicine community and world. Without spaying your pet, you can face very many health issues, behavioral issues. We'll hit more on that in later slides. But this is just a very important topic that needs to be shared. And throughout this slideshow today and presentation, I will be showing some pretty graphic pictures. So I just wanted to give a forewarning for that. But it's very, very important for you to see these and know what can happen if you do not spay your pet. Now, to kick off today's presentation, the big question is, why should I spay my pet? This is a huge question that many owners ask, and they don't really realize the benefits of spaying your pet. The benefits of spaying would be to protect against different health issues, to reduce stray population, and to prevent behavioral issues. All of these issues can be avoided by spaying your pet. So owners may not really realize how important it is and how much it can protect you and your animal. For this slide, what does spaying mean? This is the definition of spaying your pet. It's the process of removing all female organs that are inside your dog, including the uterus, the fallopian tubes, the ovaries. These allow your dogs to come into a heat cycle and they allow your dogs to reproduce. The heat cycle is kind of the red flag of saying, hey, I am able to have puppies at this point or kittens. Spaying is a term for a female while neutering is the term for a male. But today my main focus is predominantly on spaying. Now we will get into our three big reasons of why you should spay your pet. Our number one reason is health issues. With having a uterus and all of the female organs inside the pet come some serious health issues if owners aren't aware of what's happening. Number one is a pyometra. It's a uterine infection that can move throughout the bloodstream, which can be fatal. This infection is called like the silent killer in veterinary medicine, just because there's not many symptoms for this infection. It's the uterus just builds up an infection. It can cause a fever. But other than that, without going in and exploring, if we know that your dog is not spayed, that's normally a trigger. But for some, it may not be a trigger. So that's why we call it the silent killer. We also have mammary tumors. So breast cancer in our pets, they can either be benign or malignant, and they're caused by spikes of estrogen, which is released in a dog's heat cycle. So as your dog comes into heat, their hormones are going to spike through the roof and large amounts of that estrogen can cause these mammary tumors. They might show up as small. You may not feel them until they get very, very large, which can be fatal to your pet. And many owners don't really, you know, rub on their stomachs very much and they really don't notice these spots until they get large. So this is another reason why you should spay your animal. And for this slide, we have our second reason to spay. This is to reduce the stray population. Many dogs become strays due to abandonment. The male dogs that are around your location can generally smell when the females come into heat, which causes the male strays to travel to your female. Your female may be confined in a pen, but trust me, those males will find a way to get to them. If your dog is not spayed, this will happen and your dog become, can become pregnant. If you do not want these puppies or can't find home for these puppies, they can be strays, which can increase the stray population. So when a female dog is abandoned, say it's not your pet, it's just one on the street, normally you'll see their breast hanging low because they have been mothers before because when they're abandoned, they're not generally taken care of. They're just out there. They're not spayed. So the males will come to them and this will generally add to the stray population, which is very, very bad around our town here in Magnolia. That's why we have a great rescue sea caps. You can go down and see all of the strays and hopefully find you one from your own. Now sea caps comes to my work here at Eastridge Animal Hospital and we spay just about any stray female that comes to us. And we also neuter the males. This reduces the stray population a whole lot. Now for our third big reason, we have behavioral issues. An intact female, when they go into heat, they release sex hormones that can cause stress, ag aggression, and anxiety. Once your dog is spayed, they will not release these hormones in such large amounts, so it will cut back on the stress, cut back on the anxiety, and cut back on the aggression. Once your dog comes into heat, 
they release large amounts of these hormones, which cause them to go into a mothering state. Now, this mothering state can cause a lot of anxiety and aggression in your dog. They generally mother their toys just because they aren't going to have babies of their own. And this can cause a lot of aggression. Say if you go down there to reach to grab their toy, they may stress out and freak themselves out, which that's the, a lot of anxiety that's released due to these sex hormones. So a female that is not intact, which is spayed, will not release these large amounts of hormones. So they should not go through these stages anymore. This is a great reason why you should spay your pet because you will not have to deal with these behavioral issues. Spaying your pet is a very, very simple routine that's generally done at every single vet clinic that you will go to. Many animals are spayed at the ages of six months to one year, but we do have a few laggers that lag behind. You know, you might want one litter of puppies to yourself or to give to your family, and then we'll generally spay them. Most shelters offer, offer help with the cost of spaying. Here, our local CCAP shelter, you can go there and you can get a waiver for a low cost CCAP spay. This is to help maybe college kids or if you don't have enough money to get your animal spayed because it's a very expensive process. I say very expensive, it's generally around $150, which most college kids don't have. As we normally all get dogs in college just to help with our stress and our anxiety, we may not have that money to pay to get our dogs spayed, but you can also go to CCAPS and they can help you out a lot. Overall, spaying your pet is a very, very good idea for you and your pet. It can save you in the long run from having to pay more money due to health issues or behavioral issues. You might think it's a training issue that you're dealing with, but it's actually a behavioral issue due to the released hormones in your female pet. I just wanted to say thank you for listening to my presentation today. I hope I really persuaded you into spaying your pet. Now, I did predominantly focus on dogs today, but this also is for cats as well. These issues run in dogs, cats, just about every animal, female animal that you see. I did focus on spaying today just because I feel like that's more of a huge topic and you have a whole lot more health issues with a female animal than what you do with a male. They are risk having a male animal and having him still intact, but spaying to me is the most important thing to get done to your animal. Without spaying, we would have a lot of issues in our world and in our community just due to the overrun of strays, the, the health issues, the behavioral issues. Spaying really helps calm down those issues a lot. And many owners may not know that until a vet stresses that to them. If you ever have any questions, you can always ask me. I can enter in my email in one of these slides. I will be so happy to answer any questions that you may have about you or your pet. And you can also come down to Eastridge and our vet, Dr. Brian, he will help you tremendously. I just wanted to say thank you for listening to me and I hope I talk to you in this Spain, your future animal. I suppose I'm a little biased about this in a positive way because our miniature schnauzers, which we had in our house for more than 20 years, and remember the pillow over my shoulder is of a miniature schnauzer, were spayed by Dr. Brian at Eastridge Animal Hospital, so I know him quite well. It's interesting in a presentation like this that you're really focusing on a topic, Chloe is anyhow, on something that she feels very strongly about. And each of her presentations during the first summer session have been on this overall theme, which is fine. We probably wouldn't do it like this during a regular fall or spring semester. But during the summer, because everything is compressed, if you want to focus on a particular area, such as animal care, pet care, that's certainly appropriate in Chloe's case, because her format does not allow for any type of closed captioning. We'll just go ahead, as we've been doing this week, on the last 90 seconds of her presentation. Pay particular attention to two things, reinforcing the persuasive speeches on why spaying is a good thing, and also the way in which she is coming across as a persuasive speaker. Does she come across sounding confident, knowledgeable, thoughtful, 
informed and persuasive on her topic at the same time, because the informed element shows research, the persuasive takes it one step further. Here's the last 90 seconds. You might think it's a training issue that you're dealing with, but it's actually a behavioral issue due to the released hormones in your female pet. I just wanted to say thank you for listening to my presentation today. I hope I really persuaded you into spaying your pet. Now, I did predominantly focus on dogs today, but this also is for cats as well. These issues run in dogs, cats, just about every animal, female animal that you see. I did focus on spaying today just because I feel like that's more of a huge topic and you have a whole lot more health issues with a female animal than what you do with a male. They are risk having a male animal and having him still intact, but spaying to me is the most important thing to get done to your animal. Without spaying, we would have a lot of issues in our world and in our community just due to the overrun of strays, the, the health issues, the behavioral issues. Spaying really helps calm down those issues a lot. And many owners may not know that until a vet stresses that to them. If you ever have any questions, you can always ask me. I can enter in my email in one of these slides. I will be so happy to answer any questions that you may have about you or your pet. And you can also come down to Eastridge and our vet, Dr. Brian, he will help you tremendously. I just wanted to say thank you for listening to me. And I hope I talk to you in this Spain, your future animal. If you have the capability to record outside, and we had a couple of people actually do that during the pandemic. I could remember one young lady recording off her laptop on her back porch. That's certainly acceptable. For Chloe's first two speeches, she was recording inside. You were called directly over her head, was an overhead fan. And on at least one occasion, I think she had one or two dogs behind her, which is fine. We had Lexi Belt a few years ago recording inside directly behind her in her house or in her bedroom. She had a string of lights and on occasion you could see her cat. So that's certainly appropriate in this case, being in the yard. How does she come across as a persuasive speaker as opposed to what she was doing for the informative and before that the demonstrative presentations? First and foremost, the ease that all of you have on camera, as I indicated yesterday, is going to be much more apparent, where you get rid of that self-conscious nature. You'll also, guys, recall yesterday I mentioned between videos that it's probably an advantage to have your speech course online. You've got more opportunities to practice, more opportunities to feel comfortable in front of the camera, and we only see what you think is your best take. It's important, obviously, to speak in public, but if you have a bad day or something happens, you only have one opportunity to make a positive impression. We're online because so many more transactions are taking place. It's a good thing to look at yourself and be aware of that particular imaging over and over again. And she obviously is watching herself. She has a nice ease on camera, as most of you do. The design consistency also is something that we've been looking at from back to front with her storytelling. This looks like something that may have been downloaded from Slides Go, a very breezy pacing to her slides with the design consistency all the way through. She gives herself enough room on the bottom left-hand side to move around in that rectangle approach that she places on her slideshow. And then as we transition Overall, back, Overall, saying your pet is a very- As we transition back from one slide to the next, this is where, Chloe, you need to make certain that you are running your slides through some type of spell check device because check the spelling of scalpel, unless that's a correct term, but also down here, check waiver. Always run all of you, run your materials through spell check because occasionally something may slip past the goalie. Other items that she has on here are different kinds of images and text which help her remain extemporaneous, not necessarily doing stuff word by word. 
some of the behavioral issues on reasons to spay. She brought up a really good persuasive point on sex hormones. The reduced stray population, reason two, and of course she also mentioned near the end of her speech, she's focusing on dogs here, but certainly this is something that affects all different animals. But one of the challenges that you face with more and more animals that are strays, you may run into some of them that are feral and can be dangerous. But the male dogs can smell when the females come into their heat cycle. All of this stuff is really important. And most importantly, who's going to take care of them? Remember, she had a presentation earlier during the first term on heartworms. How many of these dogs, in this case, are going to be sick or potentially could spread disease, or as she mentions here, potentially be dangerous? Some of the health issues with normal and abnormal parts of the body, uterine infections, and mammary tumors. Again, very expressive with her eye contact and it comes across in her voice as well. So we continue to go back, and there she is on the same slide, continuing to move back to what does spaying mean on one of her early slides. Quote, spaying your dog is the process of removing all female organs, including the ovaries, fallopian tubes, and the uterus. And in the case of both of our miniature schnauzers, that was something that was, that was done. And it also assists, by the way, in their long-term health. It alleviates any potential diseases sexually related to them that could happen later in their lives. Let's make certain that her eyes are open. There she is. Why you should spay your dog? The spay talk. A very positive way to start our second day of persuasive speeches. And let's leave that title slide on for just a moment. How is Chloe improving with her content, as you can see on her screen, with her delivery, as you can see throughout with her visual on the bottom left-hand portion of the screen, and her visuals with all of the different kinds of interactivity that she provides in her slideshow. In this case, the interactivity being that the text and the images are bouncing back and forth, whatever makes you feel most appropriate for her presentation to start the day. That brings us to our second speaker. This is Jalissa on Loom. The topic of her presentation is why children should not have social media until 15. I should mention before I go back that as we are recording within the 1 to 3 p.m. window, I'm continuing to check both my SAU and Yahoo email addresses so if any of you who are scheduled to go send me material, it gives me the opportunity at the end of class to go ahead and play them. So let's put Jalissa's on the screen. And she is again discussing something related to social media. Here we go. Good afternoon. My name is Jalissa Olivares, and today I am going to be going over why children should not have social media until 15, or SPCH 1113, Intro to Public Speaking for first summer of 2023. Social media is websites and applications that enable users to create, share, and or exchange information and ideas in virtual communities and networks among several people. Some popular social media platforms are Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, Snapchat, TikTok, Reddit, LinkedIn, Pinterest, and Reddit. Some effects that social media has on people is that it is addictive, harmful, very manipulative, negative, distracting, changes in mental and physical health, and it can be exposing. It could be addictive because Many people want to get work done right away, but once you get on social media, you just find yourself scrolling through all the posts you get through. I happen to be one of those people. It can be harmful because many people will start to look at themselves and start comparing themselves to other people, which is a common thing that can happen once they start comparing and realizing what they have and don't have. 
it can be manipulative because many people can try to change someone's opinion in a way that can manipulate them into believing it is true. It can be negative because of the amount of things that can change to your mind, like it could create mental problems and could possibly lead to depression, make you have anxiety, possibly lead to self-harm or possibly suicide. It can affect your physical health because with social media, you want to constantly be on it and just scroll on it all day long. Although you know you have multiple things to do, you just want to scroll. So it makes you potentially lazy. And it could be exposing, especially to young children, to like sexual, sexual uh, content, which is very widespread on the internet today with many, many filters being turned off and some websites not even having filters. Here is a video on how social media is changing our brains. With social media sites being used by one third of the entire world, they've clearly had a major influence on society. But what about our bodies? Here are five crazy ways that social media and the internet are affecting your brain right now. Can't log off? Surprisingly, 5-10% to 10 of internet users are actually unable to control how much time they spend online. Though it's a psychological addiction as opposed to a substance addiction, brain scans of these people actually show a similar impairment of regions that those with drug dependence have. Specifically, there's a clear degradation of white matter in the regions that control emotional processing, attention, and decision making. Because social media provides immediate rewards with very little effort required, your brain begins to rewire itself, making you desire these stimulations. And you begin to crave more of this neurological excitement after each interaction. Sounds a little like a drug, right? We also see a shift when looking at multitasking. You might think that those who use social media or constantly switch between work and websites are better at multitasking, but studies have found that when comparing heavy media users to others, they perform much worse during task switching tests. Increased multitasking online reduces your brain's ability to filter out interferences and can even make it harder for your brain to commit information to memory. Like when your phone buzzes in the middle of productive work. Or wait, did it even buzz? Phantom vibration syndrome is the relatively new psychological phenomenon where you think you felt your phone go off, but it didn't. In one study, 89% of test subjects said they experienced this at least once every two weeks. It would seem that our brains now perceive an itch as an actual vibration from our phone. As crazy as it seems, technology has begun to rewire our nervous system, and our brains are being triggered in a way they never have before in history. Social media also triggers the release of dopamine, the feel-good chemical. Using MRIs, that's just some of the things it does to you. Thank you so much for watching my presentation. Have a great day. And by the way, just from a stylistic standpoint, this has happened to me too as well, Jalissa, where when you play a video, usually something like this will come up on the bottom and you'll probably want to make certain that you exit out. Think about the thoughtful nature that she provides to this speech. Because there is so much, and it reminded me when she was talking about this, garbage online that whenever I was younger, we were getting all of our messages through radio, television, newspapers, magazines. We did have some element of interactivity, but not nearly to the degree that you have today. You really do have to be very aware of the negative effects that social media can have and the negative impact that it can have on those who are quite young and quite impressionable. So with that in mind, let's go back to the final 90 seconds. Some of this may include the video, but we'll go ahead and pop the closed captioning on and double check how she wraps it up. Brain scans of these people actually show a similar impairment of regions that those with drug dependence have. Specifically, there's a clear degradation of white matter in the regions that control emotional processing, attention, and decision making. Because social media provides immediate rewards with very little effort required, your brain begins to rewire itself, making you desire these stimulations. And you begin to crave more of this neurological excitement after each interaction. Sounds a little like a drug, right? We also see a shift when looking at multitasking. You might think that those who use social media or constantly switch between work and websites are better at multitasking, but studies have found that when comparing heavy media users to others, they perform much worse during task switching tests. Increased multitasking online reduces your brain's ability to filter out interferences and can even make it harder for your brain to commit information to memory. Like when your phone buzzes in the middle of productive work.
or wait, did it even buzz? Phantom vibration syndrome is a relatively new psychological phenomenon where you think you felt your phone go off, but it didn't. In one study, 89% of test subjects said they experienced this at least once every two weeks. It would seem that our brains now perceive an itch as an actual vibration from our phone. As crazy as it seems, technology has begun to rewire our nervous system, and our brains are being triggered in a way they never have before in history. Social media also triggers a release of dopamine, the feel-good chemical. Using MRIs, that's just some of the things it does to you. Thank you so much for watching my presentation. Have a great day. Now, let's examine her approach at storytelling with her visuals. Because there was so much of the last 90 seconds that consisted of a video clip, which is fine, we might go ahead and check out her beginning as well with closed captioning to examine her improvement as an extemporaneous speaker. That being said, let's go back, part of the video, taking off the closed captioning, and examine what some of her previous slides look like. Here, how is social media with her webcam in the upper right-hand corner? It's a little bit tighter this time, and its effect on people. So her bullet points include addictive, harmful, manipulative, negative, distracting, changes in mental, physical health, and exposing. Now, here's where you can go in one of two directions. Jalissa can talk about this from a generic third-person perspective, or she could include personal stories of her or her friends with exposing changes in mental, physical health, distracting, negative, manipulative, harmful, and addictive. It gives her the opportunity, like a quarterback at the line of scrimmage, to have different types of options to persuade us on the negative impact of social media. Talking about one or more of these elements in detail, which is much or little specificity as she chooses. Very extemporaneous, look at her eye contact, focusing on what she wants to say and then transitioning back into what is social media. So she's discussing the means of interactions in her second bullet point and the websites and applications in the first. Because she included her video at the end, let's do it this way instead. Put closed captioning on and check out the first 90 seconds of Jalissa's persuasive speech. Good afternoon. My name is Jalissa Olivares, and today I am going to be going over why children should not have social media until 15 or SPCH 1113 Intro to Public Speaking for first summer of 2023. Social media is websites and applications that enable <clears throat> users to create, share, and or exchange information and ideas in virtual communities and networks among several people. Some popular social media platforms are Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, Snapchat, TikTok, Reddit, LinkedIn, Pinterest, and Reddit. Some effects that social media has on people is that it is addictive, harmful, very manipulative, negative, distracting, changes in mental and physical health, and it can be exposing. It can be addictive because Many people want to get work done right away, but once you get on social media, you just find yourself scrolling through all the posts you get through. I happen to be one of those people. It can be harmful because many people will start to look at themselves and start comparing themselves to other people, which is a common thing that can happen once they start comparing and realizing what they have and don't have. It can be manipulated. So she does a really good job, including personal examples, telling us about how oftentimes we're going to put our best faces forward on social media. And those comparisons that she mentions are going to potentially really affect someone, especially those who are younger, because that is what she's discussing with her title of the presentation, Why Children Should Not Have Social Media Until 15. Is something like that realistic in the long term, depending upon where you are? I suppose it all depends, but at least 
she brings up relevant points as to why the dangers are there. And let's check out how she transitions into her video clip. Many, many filters being turned off and some websites not even having filters. Here is a video on how social media is changing our brains. With social media sites being used by one third of the entire world, they've clearly had a major influence on society. But it really is a nice job of just a brief setup. If you feel it's appropriate to include a video clip in your presentation, I'll mute the audio and let it play in real time with closed captioning up as we did before, that's certainly okay. Always keep in mind if you're recording on Loom, sometimes you probably would want to make your video clip on that or any other platform somewhere in the area of about a minute. So it supplements whatever you want to say for any of your presentations. It's not necessarily required. If you wanted interactivity by just clicking on a website like I do during the lectures, that's certainly appropriate as well. We'll go ahead and pause it, take off closed captioning, and then come to the end of the presentation examine her eye contact, her ability to remain extemporaneous, her ability to be a quality storyteller, and most importantly, be persuasive on why children should not have social media until 15. So now we've had two presentations out of a number that we'll be looking at today. Brooklyn will be our third presenter. This deals with a money management topic. Should money management classes be taught in school? And here we go. Hi, my name is Brooklyn Perry, and for my persuasion speech today, I'll be doing should money management classes be taught in school? Yes, I believe money management classes should be taught in school and that they should be required. Many uh, schools have the course, but it is not required. And me personally, I feel like it should be required. Why is money management important? Money management is important because it can help you reach your financial goals, and like buying a house, a car, just having your money right, being financially stable. It can help you get out of debt or stay out of debt. Because no one wants to be in debt. It helps you with budgeting and helps you with saving your money. So why should money management classes be taught in school? When money management classes are taught in school, it can create a foundation for good habits for later on in life when you have money and have bills to pay and have all these different bills and you need to manage your money so you know what you can spend and what you need to save to pay bills with. It can also help avoid mistakes in the future that will lead to long-term money problems and when we learn how to purchase vehicles and buy homes early on in life we won't need to struggle and just struggle with knowing what we should do when we buy a house and how to purchase a vehicle do we know if we're doing it the right way we don't know if this person is trying to set us up so i feel like if we learn that early on in life then we'll be prepared for later on when we need that information Knowing manage, many management sets you up for success. And it also helps help hold people accountable because they can't say they didn't know. They didn't know about anything that comes with money because they were taught in school. So many people believe that it's not the school's job to teach money management. It is the parent, the guardian, whoever staying in the house with them. But some people do not have that role model at home, and that leads to them not knowing anything about money management, but what they have in their head, what they've seen, making big mistakes because they don't know better. It could cause them to go into debt. It can cause them to have a low credit score. It can have long-term issues, long-term money issues. And even if there is a role model in the household, they could overall forget to teach them, or they may not know themselves because no one was there to teach them. And going on to my last slide, the outcome. So the outcome of not knowing money management 
is overspending. So you won't have money to pay your bills. You can overspend on just everyday household items, laundry, soap, detergent, dishwashing detergent, liquid soap, or dishwashing soap, personal hygiene, just stuff like that. And then you won't have money to pay your bills or you will pay your bills and not have the money to buy your everyday household stuff and eating out and stuff like that. So you need to learn how to not overspend your money so you have enough money for stuff that you need. Groceries, stuff like that. Instead of eating out, you can go buy groceries and have more. So the next one is a lack of retirement funds, which means you cannot retire when you desire because you don't have the money saved up. You can be in debt. You can possibly go into bankrupt. They can repossess your car or house because you haven't made payments on it and you cannot have a savings account. And I believe a savings account is very, very, very important because when people get into a little bind, they they can pull money out of their savings account to help them. And I think everybody needs that once in a while. And I believe that you should be putting money back every month into your savings account so that you can have money when you desperately need it. So that is all I have for my pers persuasive speech. Thank you guys for watching, and I hope that this PowerPoint and my presentation helped you to see money management in a different way and see why it should be taught in schools. Thank you. A reminder, Brooklyn, don't call it a PowerPoint. Call it a persuasive speech. Always remember that. A couple of years ago, someone did that online, and I started to, I started to laugh quietly to myself. Remember, it's a demonstrative speech, an informative speech, a persuasive speech, a wild card speech. Don't ever say PowerPoint. By the way, nice job in terms of remaining thoughtful and persuasive all the way through. After we've gone through the last 90 seconds of her presentation with closed captioning up, as with everyone else, we'll check out her design consistency, how she looks on the webcam, and spelling, grammar, syntax, and punctuation on her slide structure. Last 90 seconds, closed captioning up. Here we you go. can overspend on just everyday household items, laundry, <clears throat> soap, detergent, dishwashing detergent, liquid soap, or dishwashing soap, personal hygiene, just stuff like that. And then you won't have money to pay your bills or you will pay your bills and not have the money to buy your everyday household stuff and eating out and stuff like that. So you need to learn how to not overspend your money so you have enough money for stuff that you need. Groceries, stuff like that. Instead of eating out, you can go buy groceries and have more. So the next one is a lack of retirement funds, which means you cannot retire when you desire because you don't have the money saved up. You can be in debt. You can possibly go into bankrupt. They can repossess your car or house because you haven't made payments on it and you cannot have a savings account. And I believe a savings account is very, very, very important because when people get into a little bind, they they can pull money out of their savings account to help them. And I think everybody needs that once in a while. And I believe that you should be putting money back every month into your savings account so that you can have money when you desperately need it. So that is all I have for my pers persuasive speech. Thank you guys for watching. And I hope that this PowerPoint and my presentation helped you to see money management in a different way and see why it should be taught in schools. Thank you. And I appreciate the fact that Brooklyn is waiting 1,001, 1,002, sometimes a little bit longer. And then, and only then, like I do with all of our course videos, officially ending the recording session by pressing stop. Now let's talk about her structure regarding overall design. Many of you have really improved with your thoughtful nature your ease and confidence on camera through the webcam. However, we talked about this yesterday on day one with Abriana. If you're going to wear a shirt with a design or lettering, always make certain that you have turned around your webcam because it looks as if we're getting a reverse image. Always double check. If you're wearing anything with print, to ensure that you can actually read it. If not, 
just wear something without any kind of print on it because then we wouldn't know because most of us are not going to meet in person. But little things like that matter. Not going to be an issue here, but double check for your wild card speech next week. Also, as I had indicated with Chloe, once you have all of your slides set up with your headlines, with your font size, your structure, your bullet points, anything that you have with text, always go through, whether it's Google Slides, whether it's Microsoft PowerPoint, always go through the editing function to double check the spelling. Something out like outcome would be one word. That would not be separated. Small thing, but it does matter. Nice job in setting up the headline and the bullet points to discuss the relevancy of why money management is so important. And then with closed captioning off, pay particular attention to her eye contact as we did first of all with Chloe and secondly with Jalissa. You can tell that she's practiced a lot. There's no real breaks in thought, keeping in mind, and I'll talk about this early next week, pay attention when you're watching your recordings for ers, ahs, ums, us, which are the vocalics, any issues with grammar, like, um, kinda, wanna, I mean, you know, anything that is potentially going to throw you off course by not remaining in the overall scope of things smooth. This is what I'm talking about. Role model. That sticks out like a sore thumb. M-O-D-L-E. I'll let you off easy this time, Brooklyn, but again, double check your spelling. I like the way that she has this set up. Sometimes if you feel something is important, you can put it in uppercase. Not having someone at home and some of the issues that can happen because not everyone is going to be a quality money manager. Sometimes people are going to be just inundated with little things that come up and they wind up in credit card debt. Before you guys were born, during the summer, at another institution, I had someone discuss money management from the standpoint in her persuasive speech on how being in credit card debt could literally mess you up for years because of the interest rates. So she has an excellent topic here. Again, moving backwards, why it should be taught in school. You're going to have good habits, avoid mistakes later on. Think about this for many student athletes now at Division I institutions where they have the NIL agreements in men and women's sports, name, image, likeness. You don't think it would be a good idea for all of these individuals, potentially at large D1 schools with hundreds of thousands of dollars coming in, to have some type of course in money management, little things like taxes or stocks or bonds. It's going to matter because many of them are not going to be playing in the pro. So they need to make certain that they are good money managers with what they have. Again, run through the spelling on something like vehicle sticks out like a sore thumb. And then we continue to move back to why money management is important for her bullet, bullet points from one to five, help reach financial goals, get out of debt, keep out of debt, budgeting and savings. Yes, on money management class, it should be taught in school, required, and have the course, but not required. I suppose that's something that if you're a business student, you'd be taking some type of money management course early on, particularly those of you who just got out of high school. Should money management classes be taught in school? Brooklyn makes a very persuasive case. However, again, friendly piece of advice Double check your spelling because repeated misspellings are going to affect your credibility as a speaker. That said, though, she's improved a lot in terms of her overall thoughtfulness of delivery and being a quality extemporaneous speaker. But again, with me back on camera, I want to reinforce the importance because I always did well in spelling. Use every tool at your disposal to be a quality storyteller, and that includes double and triple checking your spelling, your grammar, your syntax, and your punctuation. That brings us now to our second presentation of the week, 
that utilizes Microsoft PowerPoint. And this is going to be Michaela, her persuasive speech. She's on the bottom of the screen. Why speeding tickets should disappear. You remember we had a pothole speech using the same type of format. With this, it is slideshow and from beginning. And with Microsoft PowerPoint, once I click on from beginning, this will immediately begin. Here we go. Hello, everyone. I hope you all are doing well, because today I will be giving you a persuasive speech on why I think speeding tickets should disappear. What is a speeding ticket? Um, in the top corner here, to the left, I have a photograph of a woman getting a speeding ticket. And also on the right, I have a photo of a radar which detects speeding during traffic. But essentially, a speeding ticket is a citation issued by patrol officers to drivers who are essentially accused of exceeding the posted speed limit. Speeding tickets can be given to anyone for exceeding a speed limit at a minimum of one mile per hour over. But typically, they're only going to pull you over for doing maybe 10, 11, could even be 20 over. Traffic citations, however, are nearly the same as speeding tickets, but these can also be issued for different reasons, such as reckless driving, drunk driving, or even, you know, swerving into oncoming traffic parking incorrectly, other reasons other than speeding. What is the problem with speeding tickets? Speeding tickets are causing a lot of problems within the world in general. Speed limit signs for one have not been updated with the technology of the cars. Most cars nowadays are equipped with high powered motors, which you know isn't compatible with what speed limit with the posted speed limit signs that are currently being drivers are currently being faced with. There is also other crime in the world that is deteriorating the communities as well as speeding drivers. Probably more than speeding drivers, honestly. As you can see, I have a photograph at the top of someone having someone at gunpoint, which is also which is a crime worse than speeding, which is not a crime. And also I have a photograph of someone robbing a bank, which is a federal crime, as opposed to speeding, which is not. Speeding tickets are also expensive for no reason. You're paying two hundred to five hundred dollars for just going ten miles over the speed limit which is really outrageous. This causes underlying stress on drivers and does not prevent speeding at all. Other conflicts that we're faced with, getting a speeding ticket can also result in an increase on a driver's insurance policy. This can cause your insurance rate to rise from thousands of dollars, honestly. And they could even, even drop you from your policy if you accumulate too many speeding tickets. Some drivers drive below the speed limit, which conflicts with other drivers who have somewhere to be at a specific time. These drivers cannot reach their destination if they're doing under the speed limit because they cannot exceed the speed limit. Studies and statistics show that Speeding tickets do not combat speeding the way that officers want it to. It actually is the most ineffective way to prevent drivers from speeding. Concluding solutions. In my opinion, I personally think traffic tickets should disappear because all drivers are aware of the dangers of operating a vehicle in general and still choose to drive. And with this knowledge, drivers are also capable of driving at the speed that is really reasonable to them, which 
could be 45 miles per hour or even 70 miles per hour on an average, just depending on what type of driver you are. And also in other countries, speeding is not so monitored as it is in the U.S. Other countries are less general when it comes less strict in general when it comes to speeding tickets. And here are just a couple of my traffic citations. I have a couple from Louisiana, a couple from Arkansas, and even from our university here at Southern Arkansas. And this will conclude my presentation on why I think speeding tickets should disappear. Thank you. As you can see, if you look at the top of the screen, end of slideshow, click to exit, which I'm about to in three, two, one. This format does not allow me to look at the closed captioning or examine the last 90 seconds as we would in Loom or on Chloe's recording platform. But let's just take a look at this. The honest approach that she has with her slides, my traffic penalties, one, two, three, four. All of you have to be very, very aware that there are certain parts of the highway where individuals may be out either to get you or, shall we say, are more diligent in trying to patrol that particular area of the highway. For those of us who have been in Southwest Arkansas for a long time, we all know that when you get near some areas of Southwest Arkansas between, between Magnolia and Texarkana on US 82, that there are, some, there are some localities that are going to be quite stringent in enforcing traffic laws. And I intentionally am not mentioning any cities, but those are her traffic penalties. And then we move to some of the concluding solutions. And by the way, in the state of Texas, the outcry became so great with cameras right on stop signs or stoplights that automatic tickets were being given out. And all of a sudden they went by the wayside. I think they've had some of those in Arkansas as well, where photographs would be taken of individuals who were going through red lights or just were not necessarily being as diligent as they should have been. So let's examine these. Number one, I think traffic tickets should disappear because all drivers are aware of the dangers of operating any motor vehicle. Two, with this knowledge, drivers also drive at a speed reasonable to them, whether that be 45 or 70, I'll come back to that. Other countries are less strict in general when it comes to speeding tickets. If you're driving from Magnolia to Prescott to get on the interstate going to Little Rock on Interstate 30, for a good bit of the time, the speed limit was 70. And people always went faster than that. Now, if you drive to Prescott and get on the interstate and drive toward Little Rock, the speed limit is 75. Most people that I'm aware of, and I usually drive to Little Rock to go to the airport, are driving much faster than that. So it feels like the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, where people are driving so fast that danger could literally be right around the corner. And all of you have to be very careful. Her third bullet point, other countries are less strict in general when it comes to speeding tickets. Then we move to some of the other conflicts on how it can affect your insurance policy. And keep in mind, especially if you are a young man right out of high school or a teenager, those insurance rates are incredibly expensive. And then she's got studies and statistics and her final bullet point on they may not prevent speeding. It really probably depends on the person. And then what's the problem with the stress on drivers? What is a speeding ticket? She discusses it in detail and her title slide. Since we can't look at the last 90 seconds with closed captioning on, let's just go back into the slideshow and watch her first 90 seconds. Does she look comfortable on camera? Chloe was recording outside. Michaela looks like she's recording inside her car. Whatever works to get the job done. 
And how is she coming across in terms of being not only persuasive, but someone who is, as I've said yesterday and today, on multiple occasions, at ease on camera? First 90 seconds. Hello, everyone. I hope you all are doing well, because today I will be giving you a persuasive speech on why I think speeding tickets should disappear. It looks like here there is a delay in going from one slide to the next. So let me try something a little bit different. Let's go to her second slide, go slideshow from current slide, and see if it plays. What is a speeding ticket? I'm in the top corner here to the left. I have a photograph of a woman getting a speeding ticket. And also on the right, I have a photo of the radar which detects speeding during traffic. But essentially, a speeding ticket is a citation issued by patrol officers to drivers who are essentially accused of exceeding the posted speed limit. Speeding tickets can be given to anyone for exceeding a speed limit at a minimum of one mile per hour over. But typically, they're only going to pull you over for doing maybe 10, 11, could even be 20 over. Traffic citations, however, are nearly the same as speeding tickets, but these can also be issued for different reasons, such as reckless driving, drunk driving, or even, you know, swerving into oncoming traffic, parking incorrectly, other reasons other than speeding. Our next presenter of the day is discussing planning for your future. This is our next persuasive presentation from Ms. McKamey. Why you should plan for your future. She has tightened up her webcam a little bit, and here we go. Hi, my name is Akai McKamey, and my persuasive speech will be over why you should plan for the future. Okay. Okay, so when planning your future, you have to be considerate. You have to consider your ultimate personal life goals and find what's best for you. Find something that you're good at and that you enjoy. You enjoy and make a living out of. So, for example, I know I love the healthcare system and wanted to work for it one day, but I also had a love for teaching. So I planned ahead and took a CNA class, and I also became a teacher's aide. And <clears throat> and I was exploring both of those careers and I found out which one is best for me and which one is not for, not for me. So that is a good way to plan ahead with your future. Also, why is it important to plan your future? When planning your future, it is important because it allows you to set a goal and take proper steps to reach them. You'll be more motivated to build your savings and start investing. Planning helps you be able to impose some kind of control on your life. So you have to have the knowledge of the career, for example. If you plan on majoring in whatever career you want to major in, go to the website, go to the website of the college that you want to attend and you should be able to go under the careers that they offer and look at the degree plans and the classes that you will take. So that is another way to um, plan your future. Look at the class that you have to take. Look at what you need to know. So you can go look at it and be prepared for it in high school. You can like, OK, I need to take college algebra in college. And they offer that at your high school. You can take that and be ahead a little bit more. Also, Having the vision of it is always good because if you have the vision, you have the you have to believe it also because you why can't sorry. Having the vision of it is always good because if you believe you can, then you will. So the benefit of planning ahead when you're 
When you are benefiting your future, you're in better control of getting what you want out of life and making your vision of life become real. You can have an organization and sense of direction because without planning your goals, you never know what you want to go in with your life. So you should always plan. You should always have a plan and look at the opportunities that is around you. Some, so for some high schools, they provide nursing classes and weather classes. And if you are interested in taking those classes, you should do those in high school. So, so it's always good to be ahead. So when you're planning your future, we'll put, you will be ahead of most of your friends. Most young people don't really know what they want to do with their lives right away. So be the person that is constantly working on their sales and learning about themselves because it is better to have a plan rather than having an idea of what you want to do with your future. Because when you have a plan, you can start working on it and achieving your goal. But when you have an idea, you don't know what to, where to start and you're confused on the path that you want to go. That you want to go. So it's always good to have... <clears throat> The plan, because when you have your plan, you're like, okay, I need to have this, I need to have this, I need to have this, and I need to have this. But when you have the idea, you like, I think I need this, and I think I want to do this, you don't need to think it, you need to know it. So if you want to plan ahead and be a part of that ahead system, you need to do it. Hi, my name is Akai McKamey. Almost my got it. Is Almost got it. I was at four minutes and three seconds. There we go. That's for my own satisfaction. For everyone that you see in this course, I come back to this time after time after time because when you teach online, I think repetition is more important than ever. For all of our presenters, first and foremost, are they improving as a public speaker? A lot of the things that I've talked about, the audio on your webcam, the way that you've got your webcam set up with the lighting, where you're positioned, and what I've talked about with a couple of people today, double checking the spelling on your slides, all of that is important. But the most important thing, obviously, is going to be in a public speaking class, are you improving as a communicator? It's very obvious that all of you are. And of course, our speaker right now is a perfect example of that. Let's pay attention to the final 90 seconds with closed captioning on and double check a couple of things. When we're looking at her presentation, is she coming across, obviously, in a persuasive manner? And then little things are tells, so to speak, T-E-L-L-S, a tell. Their persona online. Do they have a presence on camera? There are many things that people can say about me, but I think one thing that I can say with certainty is that I have a presence on camera. And that's what I want you to have. Some people have it, some don't. But for a lot of this, the more you practice, the more obvious and the more natural your camera presence is going to be. Let's check it out. Organization and sense of direction, because without planning your goals, you never know what you want to go in with your life. So you should always plan. You should always have a plan and look at opportunities that is around you. Some. So for some high schools, they provide nursing classes and weather classes. And if you are interested in taking those classes, you should do those in high school. So, so it's always good to be ahead. So when you're planning your future, we'll put, you will be ahead of most of your friends. Most young people don't really know what they want to do with their lives right away. So be the person that is constantly working on their sales and learning about themselves because it is better to have a plan rather than having an idea of what you want to do with your future. Because when you have a plan, you can start working on it and achieving your goal. But when you have an idea, you don't know what to, where to start and you're confused on the path that you want to go. That you want to go. So it's always good to have... <clears throat> The plan because when you have your plan you're like okay i need to have this i need to have this i need to have this and i need to have this but when you have the idea 
you like, I think I need this and I think I want to do this. You don't need to think it. You need to know it. So if you want to plan ahead and be a part of that ahead system, you need to do it. She's really improved in terms of being extemporaneous. With all of these different takes, eventually that self-conscious nature is going to fade and your natural persona is going to come through. Let's take off closed captioning and examine her design. Be ahead, better to have a plan than an idea of what you want to do with your future. That's persuasive. Then we move down to her second point, quote, planning your future will put you ahead of all of your friends. It's the same way with a public speaking course during the summer. You know, week by week, you've got something coming up. Ideally, the thought process in time is going to be more organic, trying to visualize success. That visualization is going to be a big part of your overall level of confidence. As we move back, look at our eye contact. You can tell where her webcam is. The benefits of planning ahead. She has an attractive design, not overly cluttered, thought about really where she wanted her webcam, but a nice big headline with design consistency with the font for the headlines and for the bullet points. Benefiting from your future, you're in better control of getting what you want out of life or making your vision of life become real. If you don't have dreams, what's the point? And then number two, organization and sense of directions, because without planning your goals, you never know where you want to go with life. But that being said, the goals that you have right now, for many of you at 17, 18, or 19, are going to naturally change and evolve. And that's obviously going to be a plus. And then we continue to move back. Notice the ease on camera, the eye contact, really thinking about what she wants to say here on the importance of planning your future with a graphic. She can talk about strategy. She can talk about knowledge, future planning or vision, whether it be her, her friends, or just from a generic perspective. Quote, Planning helps you be able to impose some kind of control on your life. And then again, notice she leaves enough space here for her natural movement back and forth when speaking. When planning your future, you have to consider your ultimate personal life goals and find what is best for you. In this case, just being nitpicky, I probably would not make it a contraction. Find something that you're good at same thing here, and that you enjoy and make a living out of it. Makes perfect sense. When you're right out of high school, you may have a generic idea of what you want to do, but many of my students have indicated they had maybe a semester or a semester and a half of classes, or maybe one year, two years before they really decided on that, what to do in terms of their overall future. Quality design to the title slide, why you should plan for your future. One final thing, and we've done this on occasion as well. Let's just get to early on in her presentation. Play it as we've done so often. Examine her eye contact. Examine her ability, not necessarily to read directly off the slides, but to try to be as expressive and thoughtful in her case, which makes her comfortable, confident, likable, believable, and in this case, persuasive. How many adjectives can I give you today? You can obviously see in her case an improvement in terms of what I'd mentioned a few minutes ago, her overall camera presence. And that certainly is nice to see. As we transition from Miss McKamey to our final presentation of the day, while we're going through this, I'm continually checking in the one to three o'clock window, my SAU email address and my Yahoo email address. To the best of my knowledge, this is going to be our final presentation of the day, and we'll pop it up on the screen. Why small classrooms 
in the opinion of our final speaker, are better. This is from Autumn, and she has been experimenting, obviously, with templates and also with the location of her webcam. Remember, the slides on the far left-hand side, I don't want to see. I want to see full slides, some of the things in terms of spelling, other issues we will work on as we transition to wildcard speeches next week. But for now, this will be our final persuasive speech of the day. In Autumn's case, why she believes persuasively class size matters. Hello, I am Inteja Easter, and today I'm going to do my persuasive speech over small classrooms are better than big <clears throat> classrooms. Why may this be? Well, it results in individual attention, increase in participation, and better communication between you and your instructor. It will also allow students to have more opinions and more freedom when it comes to assignments or ideas to projects. It's also a better opportunity to learn from your peers. What impact may it have on a student? Students in smaller classrooms have higher achievement levels. This meaning in social studies, mathematics, science, English, anything, you have a greater chance of them participating. If the class is much smaller and they feel comfortable, bigger classrooms will have an impact on students' performance, making them unable to focus with, you know, all the noise. And, you know, they just won't feel comfortable if they get an answer wrong or anything. It would just make them feel uncomfortable. Smaller classrooms can have an effect on students with lower academics. So this gives the teacher a chance to actually sit down with them, talk to them about what's going on, and actually help them and see what they're struggling in. Bigger classrooms can have an effect on students' attitudes, making them lazy and wanting to go to sleep and doing what other peers are doing because the classroom is much bigger so they don't have the attention span that they need. This having a small class um, will impact a student um, relationship with their teacher. Therefore, they're on first name basis, not with the teacher, but the teacher will know all of her student or his students' names. What impact may this have on a teacher? Teachers in smaller classrooms, they have their um, their students' attention more. It's less stress on the teacher, not much more papers to grade. Um, they can do tests easily, and they just have everyone's attention, which makes it much more um, easier on them. They can easily work with one another students. Um, this is something I like. Um, I like being in a smaller classroom because my teacher is able to work with me one-on-one -on -one and making it easier for him or her and on me. Um, they also have different teaching methods. So for each student, being in the smaller classroom, they can try different methods to make each student feel comfortable and get them where they need to be. They also don't have to fight to grab the student's attention, which we all know in a bigger classroom, it's harder, it's hard to hear, everyone's talking, and it's just hard for the teacher overall to do his or her job. Also, you can do more learning activities such as product, projects, group activities. It's just more that you can do in a smaller environment. And like I was saying, environment. What would the envir environment be in both classrooms? For larger classrooms, the environment would be noisy, um, no one is paying attention. Most likely people are asleep in the back. No one can see, no one can hear. And it's just really, really chaotic. And it can be frustrating to other students and also to the teacher. Um, it can also lead students to feeling, like I said, uncomfortable and not wanting to ask questions or talk about something that they don't understand. Smaller classrooms, are very relaxing. 
you're able to see, you're not looking over someone's head, you can hear the teacher, you can ask questions because you feel comfortable, and it's just a lot more that you can do, and the environment is very peaceful. In conclusion, we can say that smaller classrooms are better overall for students and teacher. It benefits students mentally and academically, and it benefits teachers from stress, work overloads, and mentally. The environment would be so much better for students and teachers, and you will also have a great relationship, which everyone needs. Thank you again for watching, and this is my persuasive speech. So what you see with Antasia, and remember to put your name on the title slide, but what you see with her is an obvious ease on camera. When we're examining articulation and enunciation from the checklist, the SAU speech critique, one of the things that she'll have to look at is double checking when she has a dead spot. Try to stay away from uh and um. So Antasia, listen closely to that. So in time, when those pauses come, it's silent and you're not filling the air with an uh or an um. Not going to have any bearing on your grade this week, but just be aware of that as we move toward the wild card presentation. Because she's in Loom, I can go back to the final 90 seconds, check out the complete sentence structure, very confident in terms of her overall appearance on camera, which also shows she practiced this a lot as evidenced by the quality of her visuals. Let's go ahead and play the last 90 seconds. Check out her persuasive conclusion. Say environment. What would the envi environment be in both classrooms? For larger classrooms, the environment would be noisy. Um, no one is paying attention. Most likely people are asleep in the back. No one can see, no one can hear, and it's just really, really chaotic, and it can be frustrating to other students and also to the teacher. Um, it can also lead students to feeling, like I said, uncomfortable and not wanting to ask questions or talk about something that they don't understand. Smaller classrooms are very relaxing, you're able to see, you're not looking over someone's head, you can hear the teacher, you can ask questions because you feel comfortable, and it's just a lot more that you can do, and the environment is very peaceful. In conclusion, we can say that smaller classrooms are better overall for students and teacher. It benefits students mentally and academically, and it benefits teachers from stress, work overloads, and mentally. The environment would be so much better for students and teachers, and you will also have a great relationship which everyone needs. Thank you again for watching, and this is my persuasive speech. She has an ease on camera, a likability, that presence that I've been reinforcing over the last two class periods on camera comes in. Listen closely, however, when any of you have a dead spot, an uh or an um can crop in. Watch and listen to yourselves closely so those can be eliminated in time. Now, whenever I say that, guys, most people that you run into may not even necessarily be aware that vocalics or vocalized pauses, ers, ahs, ums, us exist. So if I reinforce it, it's not something that is going to adversely affect your grade because once you become aware of it in time, you're going to intentional pause, intentional pause again, wait, think about what you want to say, and then go to a particular bullet point. As I was mentioning with one of our earlier presenters, benefiting, please make certain that you're running the slideshows through spell check so you're not going to have two spelling errors benefiting and academically because that's not even close. Double check your spelling. That's why it's there. 
let's now examine her slides and her ability as a communicator in terms of eye contact from back to front. From the conclusion, now back to what the environment would be like in classrooms. Are they relaxed? Very expressive up here. Same on the impact that it has on a teacher, such as the different teaching methods, because everyone's going to be different. You can take the same class at two different universities or the same class at the same university from two different professors and have two totally different experiences. Learning activities, more on bigger classrooms, transitioning back to why are small classes better than bigger classes? And then you can learn from your peers, have more opinions and freedom. Again, this is where the spelling just jumps up and bites you. You have to run it through spell check. And transitioning back to the beginning on class size matters. Sometimes I suppose it depends upon the school district. If you are leaving SAU and going to a larger university in the fall, sometimes the introductory level courses may be taught by a graduate assistant and may be very, very large where there is not as much interaction that is going to be available than maybe a smaller class that you had in high school. Larger institutions may not necessarily be that user friendly in terms of overall ability to communicate one on one with a teacher in high school or with a professor at a larger university. It all depends upon the circumstances and where you go. So obviously, one of the things that you're going to have to work on here is double check the spelling because something like that is really going to affect your credibility as a speaker. But as a speaker yourself with the delivery, you come across quite well. Now there are a couple of things that I want to discuss before we wrap things up for the week. 15 class sessions, including today, four more to go. A wild card speech can really be anything that you would like to discuss. In the introduction to public speaking area, if you scroll through this window, you will eventually, past all of the materials we have looked at so far, wild card is going to be near the bottom. We'll talk about this in depth on Tuesday of next week with wild card speech topic selection. Alphabetically, we will eventually come down. Some of these have been from the first summer session. Beginning with asexuality, charmed, these two presentations in alphabetical order will show you different kinds of wild card speech topics, audio, video from the last few years. Down here are videos, course videos from this year and last year from summer one down here of 2022, indicated by a Z. And then with the X, or I should say the Y, which is going to be first summer 2022. For some reason on Google Drive and the website, the videos are not playing. Don't know why. But just start thinking about what you would like to talk about for a wild card presentation. There are a couple of you who gave your demonstrative and informative speeches who got a little bit behind and I don't see anything in my email. Please make certain that I get those ASAP. Next is my YouTube channel. At this location, you can go to the playlist you can also click on videos, but realistically, the best thing to do is to click on the playlist. And between now and Monday, I will add different types of wild card speeches that will supplement what we have here from spring 2020, first summer 2020, fall 2020, 
fall intercession 2020, first summer session 2021, and first summer session 2022. So directly under last summer's persuasive speech, why you should never work in the food industry, we have different kinds of wildcard speeches. These are in chronological order, how to make great coffee, making special effects, motherboards and big hands, get a job at a gym, getting a head start in your career, creating TikTok videos. Those are just some of a number of topics that you can examine for a wildcard speech. Again, anything that you think would be appropriate to conclude the term, something that you would really like to discuss that ideally is going to be your best overall presentation. I've talked about little things today, but let's get back to the spelling on slides for just a moment. That's something that could potentially affect your credibility and your score. You can have a quality speech and I may dock you a point just because there may be some spelling errors that just jump out like a sore thumb. That's something that must be alleviated. Other things like audio on the webcams can be tweaked a little bit. I'll talk about that a little bit during class time on Monday. We'll encapsulate a lot of that at the outset. Let's return to the student preview mode of Blackboard. I have it in the student preview mode. Probably Sunday night, I will post the scores at my grades. Down at Class Collaborate Ultra, we now have two different pages of course recordings. Menu, recordings, session 15 will be on top. We have basically 10 for each panel. You move to page two, our first four class sessions, and then everything that we have done, including yesterday and the infamous Tuesday session where the internet knocked us offline. I was glad just to get that video available for what we did. I did not want to re-record that. Of course, homepage announcements. This will change to week five with everything else probably remaining the same. For the instructor information, I always talk about a link to my website where we were just at, my YouTube channel also. Then at the course syllabus, let's check the actual syllabus first to remind all of you of where we stand in terms of point allocation. Demonstrative, informative, persuasive, wildcard speeches, each worth 20 points. The self-evaluation speech critique, 10. We'll talk about that probably each day next week to some degree. Class participation, 10 points. There are some of you who have gone on to Blackboard, but I don't necessarily have any speeches. This is a situation where you must get material done week by week. I can't grade what I don't have. It's really important that as much as possible, we stay up to date with getting material done. With students in an online course, you must be proactive. I will not accept four speeches next week. That's unfair to the rest of your classmates that got everything done on time. Returning to the course syllabus area, the speech schedule we've talked about with day one and day two, we'll wrap it up with the course itinerary, focusing on next week's last four class sessions. Monday, June 26, wildcard speech research. Tuesday, June 27, wildcard speech topic selection. Wednesday, June 28, wildcard speech day one. Thursday, June 29, wildcard speech day two. Always make certain that you're watching all of the course videos in their totality, not only to pick up on how you can improve as a speaker and a researcher, but also some of the things that I've been talking about with research, with topic selection, with the self-evaluation speech critique, that 
repetition that I talk about all the time because I believe repetition is important. Whether you're watching yourself in your dorm room or on your back porch or how you can get rid of any of the issues with vocalics or how you can improve your spelling on the slideshows, it all matters. The total package matters. So as we conclude for the week with 15 of the 19 class sessions out of the way, let me reinforce, if any of you got behind with the persuasive speech, I need them over the weekend. There are a couple of you, as I'd indicated with another screen up, that have been watching Blackboard or have been online but never sent me anything. The time has passed for anyone to send me a demonstrative or informative speech. You need to make certain that you are proactive, as I mentioned a moment ago, and get stuff done on time. Let's make certain that we finish in style next week. Double check your files to make certain that I get everything. And when you're watching the videos, think to yourself, how can I improve? How have I improved? How is that going to help me as a communicator outside of the classroom? How can I improve speaking to the camera and being a quality communicator? We've made good strides in a relatively short period of time. And the tools that you learn here can carry you a long way if you stay at SAU or whether you go somewhere else. Being your own worst critic in a positive way in the long run is one of the best things that you can ever do because you are judged every day on your ability as a quality, thoughtful, likable, and knowledgeable communicator. Four class periods to go. S4, SPCH 1113, Introduction to Public Speaking for the first summer session of 2023. That concludes the recording session for today.